Hello, Bezel T3. Tomorrow I've got another uh, treatment that I've got to do. Uh, there's there's three of them. I'm, this will be number two. Uh, so I want to get the video I want to present on Wednesday in the can. And I got a comment uh, from a guy named Warren Gross. This was from last Saturday's Mario Murillo video I did. By the way, sorry about the audio. This is kind of a test for getting it right this time. And. Um, also, I'm doing, I'm going to be doing it differently. I'm going to try it at least to see if it works because Perry Stone gave me a copyright strike. He complained that I infringed on his copyright on some crazy book he did about uh, the healing power of the Lord's Supper and so forth. So I need to be safe and I need to make what I'm doing more about what you know my video is and and have that kind of as, as a, an addendum of what i'm doing as i use the clip so hopefully it's giving me enough separation i'm sure you guys have comments about that but i'm going to give it a try anyways this comment came from the mario murillo video and uh, Warren Gross says this, you rightfully criticized him, that's Mario, for advertising his book like it was scripture. That was Perry Stone's intro. Terrible. However, you consistently present the Westminster Catechism as a book that is equal to scripture also. Yes, yes you do. Before you complain about the speck in his eye, you should remove the log that is in your own. Well, I'm going to disagree with that, of course. One, it's not the Westminster Catechism. It's called the Westminster Standards, which includes the Westminster Confession of Faith, the smaller and larger catechisms. It's the standards together from the Westminster Assembly way back when, in the 1600s. They are summaries of what Scripture teaches. And what I want to do by testing the audio to make sure I'm not splitting the channels anymore is I want you to listen to a guy by the name of John Gerstner, Gerstner, I should say, a fantastic teacher, and he does a whole series on the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I highly recommend. Remember, the Bible is God's word. The, the confessions, any good confession is going to explain what the Bible is teaching in a, in a concise summary fashion, and a good confession is always going to give you text to go back and look at to make sure that what the confession is saying agrees with Scripture. So let's listen to what uh, John Gerstner has to say about the, uh, the Westminster Confession. The most important thing, I would say, to know about the Westminster uh, uh, Confession, theologically speaking, is that it is a determined attempt to remain faithful to the Bible and to explain in brief compass what the 66 books of Holy Scripture actually do reveal. It is a magnificent coverage of the subject in a very systematic fashion, beginning with the doctrine of Scripture itself and ending in the original 33 chapters with the final judgment and the last things. It's very comprehensive and at the same time very detailed as far as such brief coverage will uh, permit. Now it's okay, I just hit the bar like Stephen Kozar. <laughs> We've talked a few times over the past uh, years, and uh, I, he's a great guy. By the way, he's a fantastic artist. If you've never seen his work, go to Stephen Kozar and look at what he does with um, with whatever medium he uses. I can't remember off the top of my head, but they are so realistic. You you you'd be convinced that you are looking at a photograph, and yet it is a uh, an artist rendering of um, of real life landscapes and, and other things. Anyways, Stephen Kozar, I highly recommend him. Remember. Everyone has a confession of faith as they read the Bible. You know, some people say no creed but Christ. Other people say, I just look, I just read the Bible. Look, no one just reads the Bible. Everybody comes to the Bible with certain presuppositions, either in what they've been taught by other people or by creeds or confessions. But the Bible is the authoritative word of God. Everything else that is used is subordinate to the scriptures. I, I heard one guy from, uh, from, from uh, oh, where was it, somewhere in Europe, he had asked a person in America, he said, what is your confession? And the, the, the American says, well, I don't have a confession. Uh, I just read the Bible. And the European guy looks at him and says, but it's such a big book. <laughs> you know, we've got to be able to boil this thing down to specific doctrines. And so that's what I want to offer you today. 
I did a video on uh, the early creeds, the ecumenical creeds, um, the Nicene Creed, and I believe the the Council of uh, Chalcedon. Maybe I include that. I don't. I don't remember. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tighten it up a little bit so it's not so long. But that's what I want to give you this Wednesday, and then next uh, Saturday when I present the the um, the weekend video, uh, I'll be doing it on um, what is it? The Toronto Blessing. So check this out if you're still interested, and uh, we will talk to you on Saturday. A small group of devout Jews have gathered in Jerusalem to examine their shattered hopes and contemplate their dark future. The leader of their organization has just been executed for treason against Rome. Each man and woman in the sect may face the same fate. This is the state of mind of the people we have come to call the Christian Apostles in the weeks after the death of Jesus of Nazareth. Hello, Bezel Triple Three. Shattered hopes in a dark future? This was the mindset of the disciples weeks after the death of Jesus? Yeah, I couldn't disagree more with that introductory statement from the documentary called Christianity the First 2000 Years, which was originally produced for the A&E Network back in 1998. Now what I want to do is use a few clips from this documentary in order to discuss two primary doctrines of the Christian faith, the Trinity and the two natures of Jesus the Christ. As I've got a little diagram here, I kind of like it. you got God in the center, God is Father, God is Spirit, God is Son. But the outside ring, the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Son. They are distinct persons within the Godhead. Now, just in the past two weeks, I've had conversations with professing Christians who appear from the very things that they were saying to be, well, at least somewhat confused concerning one or both of these most essential teachings about who God has revealed himself to be in the books of the Old and New Testaments. So let's do that, and we'll begin with some early church background. Many of the group's followers, including Simon Peter, claim to have seen the risen Jesus mysteriously resurrected after his death and burial. Is this a sign that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the one who will save Israel, and that he has conquered death? Or is it a trick of the imagination, a devoutly wished-for remedy for a catastrophic situation? Now, don't you just love the embedded skepticism of seemingly every documentary we find on Jesus? The post-resurrection accounts are many. The number of people who are reported to have seen the risen Christ, as recorded in the New Testament, number in the hundreds. And yet, could it be simply a trick of the imagination, a mass hallucination of hundreds of people, and of course, an empty tomb with the body of Jesus never having been produced by the Romans or the Jews? Guys, the whole reason for the explosion of the Christian faith is the absolute confidence that this same Jesus who was crucified on a Friday was raised from the dead and seen by his followers on the following Sunday. Now, let's fast forward to the third century of Christianity. The Christian faith has spread all over the continent of Europe and finally a Roman emperor has embraced the faith. But now that Christianity held an empire, new beliefs and doctrines were appearing to trouble the faithful. Now keep in mind that from the end of the first century, all the books of the New Testament we have today had already been written, and by the middle of the second century were largely recognized by the early church to be scripture on par with that of the Old Testament books. Nearly 300 years after the death of Jesus, the first Christian Bible is about to be completed, and it will bring with it an entirely new set of troubles to the world of Christendom. Now, before we talk about what happened at Nicaea, let's remember that doctrinal error in the Christian faith started springing up right from the get-go. In AD 48, Paul writes this to the church in Galatia. 
He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. The time, 325 AD. For it is here at Nicaea that Christianity will develop an official statement of faith, a creed which will forever set forth the definition of Christianity. The Council of Nicaea was convened because of the spread of what's called Arianism, which is really just a form of the kind of monarchianism that teaches that Jesus was not equal with God the Father, but rather a creation of God the Father. Now, an important term was used by Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, to describe the oneness of the Father and the Son as being one in substance and nature. It's the Greek word homoousius, which means of the same substance or of the same essence. The word was used to contend against the word that Arius was using, which is homoousius, meaning similar but not the same essence. The immediate concern of Constantine and his Christian advisors is the basic nature of Jesus and of God. Now that's very true. The concept of the Trinity is not an easy idea to grasp and almost invites wrong thoughts to pop up. However, the scripture is clear on this Trinitarian concept. Now I'll give some examples of scriptures in a minute. The Council of Nicaea's final decision by a vote of 300 to 3 is that Jesus is of the same substance as God. Arius loses. The concept of the Trinity triumphs. To make the matter absolutely clear, the bishops of the council create a creed or oath to which they expect all Christians to adhere. Now this is absolutely crucial. The Nicene Creed did not create the doctrine of the Trinity. Rather, the biblical concept of the Trinity and the two natures of God the Son are succinctly summarized in the Creed. Now here are just a few passages from which the summary of the Creed flows. Matthew 28, 19. <clears throat> Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's a very well-known passage. How about 2 Corinthians 13, 14? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, I'll, I'll gloss there, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Prior to this time, there has been no accepted Christian Bible. Each congregation and community throughout the empire had its own collection of holy books. Amongst these are not only the traditional scriptures, but Gnostic Gospels and such texts as the Revelation of Peter, the Letters of Clement, and the Book of Advice and Ethics called the Shepherd of Hermas. Uh, not so fast there, Mr. Narrator. By the middle of the second century, only six or so books out of the 27 we now have were not universally agreed upon as apostolic and authoritative by the early church. Origen mentions the four Gospels, Acts, 13 of Paul's letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, and Revelation as recognized by all the churches. There was simply no substantial debate as to whether or not the letters of Clement or the shepherd of Hermas were to be included in the canon of the New Testament. I suppose the absolute moment when the die is cast is when Constantine says, I'm going to subsidize 50 huge Bibles. Nobody will say to Constantine, well, we haven't quite decided yet what's in and out. You say, yes and then you decide. And at that moment, Clement is out, the shepherd of Hermas is out, and your decision is made. And that's really the last step in the closing down of the canon of the New Testament. Now, John Dominic Crossan of the Jesus Seminar <laughs> makes it sound like it was a simple knee-jerk reaction to Constantine's edict that closed the canon. But in reality, the church included the 27 books we now have because they had already been recognized as having apostolic authority and having been divinely inspired. Religious orthodoxy is a matter of national security, just as important to the defense of the empire as the fabled walls around Constantinople. 
But while the walls stand firm, the Orthodox faith is shaken again and again by the emergence of new ideas. You know, I'm reminded of the words of Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And from here on out, there are no more new ideas, only rehashed and repackaged heresies. In the year 451, the Emperor Martian calls the Fourth Ecumenical Council to grapple with the Monophysite question. Monophysitism teaches that the one person of Jesus Christ is neither human nor divine, but rather was kind of a hybrid that was a blending of the two natures. When the Eternal Son came to Earth, he had only one nature, mono, meaning one, and physis, meaning nature, hence the name monophysite. There was also a heresy called Nestorianism, which what, which, in which the person of Christ is basically two separate persons, each with its own nature. Now, both of these heresies go way too far from what the scriptures teach, and therefore another council was critical in order to clarify and be precise as to what Orthodox Christianity actually teaches. Held in the city of Chalcedon, the council sessions are long and bitter. Ultimately, the Council reaffirms the Orthodox Creed, articulated a century earlier at the First Council of Nicaea. And there it is, folks. The doctrine of the Trinity depends on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit being truly God. And the doctrine of salvation depends on the person of Jesus, God the Son, having two distinct natures, divine and human. And the creed or statement of Chalcedon lays out in bold relief what the Bible teaches about God and the Son and to what is to be believed and confessed by those who call themselves Christians. The creed drives home the point that the eternal Son who is outside of time became human at a particular point in time. The eternal Son became what he was not in eternity past, namely human, without any change to his eternally divine nature. Remember, the Chalcedonian Creed points to Scripture as the source of its teaching concerning the nature of Christ. It is found in the prophets, from Christ himself, and from the tradition of the early church fathers. And in, I want to leave you with one great passage that really underscores all that we have been talking about. Philippians 2, 6-8. through 8. Although he existed... Now, who's he there? Jesus Christ, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality, sameness in essence or being, with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, and that doesn't mean he set his deity aside, that means he set the prerogatives of his godness, okay, he put them aside, didn't want to use them, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But even when he was dying on the cross, folks, he was fully God with all the attributes and characteristics common to the other members of the Trinity.